You all are in for a treat this morning, mainly because you don't have to listen to Jonathan or myself, but you get to listen to someone else instead of us. Uh, Brother Jeff Archie is here with us this morning. He and his wife, Renita, they reside in Cleveland, Tennessee. As you heard in our Bible class hour, Jeff is the director and speaker of the International Gospel Hour radio program. He also engages in annual gospel meetings, seminars, and lectureship work throughout the year. He teaches occasionally at the Chattanooga School of Preaching and Biblical Studies, and he also labors with Polishing the Pulpit, held yearly in Sevierville, Tennessee. And I might also add, he is also the voice of the Scattered Abroad Network, if I can put a shameless plug there. For those of you who listen to our network, you might recognize his voice from that. Uh, Brother Jeff is a graduate of the Nashville School of Preaching and Biblical Studies and the Great Commission School in Nashville. He also attended David Lipscomb and Fried Hardeman Colleges. Uh, Jeff was here at East Hill in 2015. He spoke at the Truth and Love Lectureship. And then also in 2027, he is scheduled to be here uh, as well for a gospel meeting. He is grateful to be here today. I know that we're grateful uh, to have him today. I guess, Jeff, when was the first time I met you? St. Louis Lectureship? St. Louis Lectureship, I guess I was, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years old at that point. Um, but I have looked up to Brother Jeff and his wife uh, for all of these years. He's a great, been a great role model to me, and it's my honor to introduce him to you all today. Brother Archie, come and speak the word. In the realm of 1 Corinthians 14, 40, let me pause here, let our sound guys know that the lapel mic went red, so I'm going back to this mic here. All right. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. Do you ever sing that hymn? And instead of looking at the screen or your songbook, look at Psalm 148. That's where the hymn is taken. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah that Jesus Christ died for our sins. The night before in that garden we sang moments ago, night with ebon pinion. Very unique wording of a song, but we are to sing with the spirit and the understanding, ebon, form of a word, Black, dark, pinion, a winged night with ebon pinion as a black feather or wing is hovered over that while the Lord is suffering, there is a protection there of the Father, but yet he makes the plea if there's any other way, let this cup or let this suffering pass from me. But dear friends, there was no other way. The Lord was mindful of us. He loads us with His blessings daily as we see in the Psalms. And then we're able to tell the story of Jesus. We're able to take the pulpits of this nation and around the world. We're able through the use of radio, television, whatever it takes that we can tell the story of Jesus. On the day of Pentecost, they told the story of Jesus. They preached Christ. And in so doing, there were those that responded to the Lord's invitation. Verse 41 of Acts 2, How many that received His word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. But I want to drop down to verse 47. Because in verse 47, we will use that verse many times and rightfully teach that individuals are added to the church that are obedient to the gospel. But we don't need to miss the first part either. The church, they were praising God and having favor with all the people. Now in this way, they were praising God and yet they were looked upon by many in a favorable way. They looked upon themselves in a favorable way, loving and helping one another. Acts 2, verses 44 through 46 explain that even further. And so when you take a look at those within the church and you see that they had favor with all the people and the opportunities that opened for them, 
we come today as individuals who pause and say, Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. Although he suffered in that garden and suffered upon the cross, he did so because the Lord was mindful of us. And now we can tell that story of Jesus and we can walk as they did in the early church, praising God and having favor with all the people the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Church today, let us motivate ourselves by praising God. But let's also keep in mind favor with all the people from the standpoint that there is a world out there that needs favor. There's a world out there that needs to hear Jesus Christ. And thinking about your good work and coming to work with Caleb tomorrow and to help him with his podcast and to be a part of that, I've got to stop here and tell this. I can't believe it's been that long since I met that little skinny young man that could play basketball exceptionally in the St. Louis area. And of course, I've known of Caleb's grandfather, Brother Rod Rutherford, for a number of years. When Caleb was in school at Memphis, we would text a little bit, touching base with him, how he's doing and all. And I said, by the way, Caleb, I may see your grandfather coming up next week. I'm doing a meeting in Sevierville. And at the time, Brother Rutherford preached in Gatlinburg. Let me throw this in. My wife is about to worry me to death to retire and go preach somewhere in Gatlinburg. I wonder why. If you live in Gatlinburg, where do you go to the mountains? It's just a question. You know, think on it. Let me know later. But I said, Caleb, I may see your grandfather next weekend. He said, oh, really? Or next week. He said, really? He said, well, tell him hello for me. I said, Caleb, I just don't go around the country giving greetings and hellos to people for nothing. He wrote back. He said, what's your cost? What's your price? I said, 10 memorized verses assigned to you by Keith Mosier. A few seconds later, the text came back. He said, oh, never mind. I'll just call him myself. <laughs> Those are precious moments. You see, when brethren come together, there's a great favor there, great joy, things we can enjoy along that line, and it's good to be with you. I want you to think with me of the text that our good brother read earlier from 1 Thessalonians 1, 3 through 8, and especially in verse 8, when he told the church there that your faith toward God or your faith in God or it is God word God word forwarded it's toward God your faith to God word is spread abroad today your lesson is simply titled a faith that is spread abroad I've been doing a little homework for you East Hill See of your good works, the things that you are in doing, the things of which you are involved. And as I was looking at that, I thought, well, allow me today as you have permitted me to come and to spend time with Caleb and I'm enjoying, I'll enjoy my time with him. And then also, too, to come and to see the good work you're doing and for you to allow me to come and talk about the International Gospel Hour and our work. Let me in turn grant something to you. Your faith is indeed spread abroad. Your faith, your work, the labors that you do are known in this area. In this text, the Apostle Paul comes down to verse 8 and lets them know that you have a faith that is spread abroad or your faith to Godward is spread abroad. How did they get to verse 8? Number one, they got to verse 8 because of verses 5 and 6. Your faith is spread abroad because of your obedience. When we look at verses 5 and 6, Paul talks about the gospel. How the gospel came unto them. It came unto them in word. In language that we could understand, the gospel comes to us of how we can understand and see God's will for our lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 4, the Apostle Paul said, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, 
but in the power of God. When you and I stopped our lives chasing our wisdom, chasing, well, I can straighten this out and then I'll obey God. When we backed off what we tried to do and realized what God had done and realized what God will do, then we changed our thinking and we allowed the power of that word to come into our lives. We looked at the word and said, that's my answer. Secondly, the gospel that came unto them, not only in word, but in power. Well, Romans 1 and verse 16 reminds us how the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And he began that verse by saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power that brings us to where we need to be and what we need to do. And when we could see how powerful the gospel was, we knew that it would address our sins because that was the good news we'd been looking for. Stay with me in the verse and notice that the gospel came unto them in the Holy Spirit. Paul explains this in Romans 15, 19, how that through mighty signs and wonders, but the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about Illyricum, a city there, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. All Paul did was go back and say it was from Jerusalem, and that's what we noted as we began our study last hour, how the gospel came forth from Jerusalem and went into all the world. And it was affirmed by those, according to Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4, that great salvation spoken by the Lord and confirmed by signs, wonders, and different miracles. I like to do various segments in the International Gospel Hour broadcast. I try not to do back-to-back, -back, but if I do, I try to let folks know if you missed one, here's the way you can get the other and so on. But I just wanted to do some programs where I'm taking a text and as we say, expositorily look through it or a verse at a time exposing the truth and looking at it, expository manner. And I'm in Mark chapter 1 of how Jesus used the proof for his preaching. When he cast out that unclean spirit out of that man in the synagogue, and they looked up and said, what doctrine is this? That the spirits will obey him. Did it ever occur to you that spirit probably had more faith than a lot of people because he acknowledged who Christ was and even said who he was. And Jesus cast that unclean spirit out of that man. Going back, the proof, his power showed his preaching. Dear friends, the gospel that came to them, notice fourthly here, in assurance. They were assured this was the gospel and came, uh, and came in much assurance. I like for something to be assured. That means I know I can count on it. The Corinthian brethren counted on the gospel. For Paul told them in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 1, not only had it been preached to them, not only had they heard it, not only had they received it, but they not only were they saved by it, but they would continue to be saved if they continued and continued in the Word and in the Scriptures of what they were to do. Dear friends, when we take a look at a faith that is spread abroad, it begins because of our obedience to the gospel of Christ. That is how the works are able to carry forth, beginning by one's obedience. If you've had yet to obey the gospel of Christ, the power of the gospel continues. And when we note that they are called the church, in verse 1, the elect of God, in verse 4, followers of the Lord, in verse 6, how? By receiving the word, their obedience. Our faith is spread abroad to begin with by obedience to the word of God. How about second? Let's back up a little bit more. We get to verse 8 because of what comes before. Because of your faithfulness. Look in verse 3. It's not enough to be obedient to the gospel, but your faithfulness. 
I don't know of any preacher that has not looked at verse 3, found the perfect three-point outline there, and preached it. But what a great pattern. Paul's writing to this church, and he says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. Our efforts should be works of faith. We believe and we work toward that. We put forth the strength that is needed for the cause of Christ. In James chapter 2, beginning with verse 14, James is not talking about faith and works, but a faith that works. That our works express the faith that we have in Christ. And context of James 2, as those who are obedient, our works express our obedience, and they are indeed works of faith. There's no greater thing than to grow in our work of faith. I remember last year when I began with the International Gospel Hour, I would have two questions asked of me, either in print or travel. When are you going to get back on WSM 650 and do you have a podcast? And I'm thankful, as you know from last hour, those accomplished But I reached out to our media group consultant, a gentleman that represents us in negotiations with stations, and I said, see if you can get us back on WSM 650. I grew up in Nashville. I know of WSM 650. I love WSM. Remember growing up listening to the Atlanta Braves, the Opry on Saturday night, and all that. I love that. I I love WSM 650. Great station. Great history. And I knew one time we were on that station. He contacted me and I said, see if you can get us on in the evening. But they no longer do the evening. For a number of years, Winford was on in the evening. You get an 8.30 time on WSM. It goes worldwide, folks. It goes all throughout the country. But they only do 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. on Sunday morning, their religious block. And the young lady told him, said, we have an opening at 5 a.m., 5.30 a.m., and 6 a.m. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many of y'all are up that early on the Lord's Day morning? And if you are, chances are you're trying to get awake so you can be here and give the proper attention. Weekends or Saturday, Sunday, as looked upon, people don't rise that early. We respectfully declined, and he said, if you have another opportunity, another time, let us know. Folks, I started praying. I was going to have faith in God. We were going to get on in Nashville, Tennessee, somewhere, somehow. Not WSM, WLAC, WNAH, whatever. We were going to get there. So I prayed, Lord, grant it to us, if it be your will. About a week later, he sends me a text. He said, you've got to read this text. And she said, if I can move someone, would your client be interested in 7.30 on Sunday morning? My reply to him was, yes, let's do it. I almost said to him, does a hog glove slop? Yes, I'll take it. And we were restored in the time slot we had when we came off at the same price means the world to us folks when we believe and trust in the lord and we pray and we purpose and allow god to do his work and his will now someone may ask well what if your answer would have been wlac we would still given god the glory and he would have opened doors there too folks that work of faith keeps us going how about a labor of love we love what we do It takes our work of faith up a notch in labor. That word labor, when you look at it, means to exhaust. But looking at the root of this word in this text, it is an interesting thing that means to beat the bread. I thought that's an interesting parallel, interesting definition. But if you ever watch someone prepare bread, prepare biscuits, And they work the dough and work the dough and work the dough and work the dough and and keep working it and keep working it until it gets just right. Folks, we keep working and keep working until we get it just right. We're persistent. We have that work of faith, but it's a labor of love. We love what we're doing. We're working. We are dealing with it. 
You know, any effort in the church requires hard work. It takes your efforts. It takes mine. When you see congregations that are involved with a work of faith and a labor and love, they're faithful. People love to be a part of that. People enjoy that. There's a work ethic that you cannot deny. And in Colossians 1 and verse 10, Paul says, allow these works to be fruitful. Fruit that will abound to your account, as we note from Philippians 4, 17. And then also to be zealous with our works for the Lord. Titus 2 in verse 14. I mentioned last hour of our seminar, Seek Out Among You. And within the seminar, there is one thing that we mention that sometimes we forget. Seek out among you, look at your deacons and their work, and ask yourself how long have they been doing that specific work. And sometimes changing deacons around in other responsibilities has been known to refresh them, restore a zeal, and help grow in those areas that are needed. Folks, that's the beauty of our labors and our work. We keep working with it and working with it. I remember when I was in local work in Cleveland, Tennessee, we tried Monday night for the master. It didn't work. It had nothing to do with the master. It had nothing to do with Monday nights. It just wasn't feasible for us. We tried it. So you look and say, why didn't it work? Well, we figured it out. Folks, we had individuals at the time that lived in 11 different zip codes. We had folks that were scattered out. Let's think about this for a moment. A lot of those people, they have email. Now, let's see. If I can send an email to Brother John, who lives way out yonder, rather than him come all the way to the building and get an assignment and go all the way back and visit somebody that was a guest a mile from his house, what if we could email that assignment, he gets it, and goes to see that neighbor? Folks, it worked. And then we sought out other times for opportunities of fellowship among us. You see, it's modifications like that that, that you're beating the bread. You're, you're working it. Say, well, this doesn't seem to work. Then we seek out what does. I love 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain. Now folks, when we have a work of faith and a labor of love that seems to take it up a notch, patience of hope is vitally important. You see, the word patience there means that you keep enduring. You are enduring with hope, which is an anchor to the soul. You press onward, you persevere with it. You have that hope that is an anchor of the soul. You are enduring. You are persevering. You press onward, loving your labors, and allowing your faith to work. And we endure and we stay with it. Folks, if anything has taught us endurance, staying with it, perseverance, Faithful to our Lord, if it hadn't been about the past year with that pandemic, I don't know what it was. I talked to elders different places. Elders were struggling. They were trying to carry forth their work as shepherds, not only in the spiritual sense, but to care also in the physical sense. James 5 is there. Is any among you sick? Let them call for the elders. You've got to be concerned with that. I felt for elders, especially in the past year. But you know, we endured, didn't we? We've stayed with it. We're not out of the woods yet. But folks, in this old world, I have a feeling that when something else gets settled down, something else is liable to come right around the corner. That's why we need to keep going. 
with our work of faith, our labor of love and patience of hope. As a matter of fact, I believe that through that pandemic, we're going to rise up better than before. I don't want to go back to normal. I want to go back to better or go better to the glory of God. Yes, shut-in list seem to have gotten longer because of aged folks. And I use that term with respect from the book of Titus. Pre-existing conditions, things and concerns. Well, how can we better serve those folks? Shut-ins sometimes get shut out. God forbid they are our family. And then, well, sure, attendance took a shot, but it's coming back, and it will. It was a pandemic, folks. It wasn't a split. Be thankful. And if anything else... It got a lot of preachers out in front of cameras preaching the gospel through tools as Facebook and Zoom and YouTube and other places that you probably couldn't get in front of a camera at GBN. The funniest thing I saw was Tom Hanks with that Forrest Gump look. And it said at the top, and just like that, and at the bottom it said, we all became televangelists. A lot of truth in that. There were doors that were open that now we can grow and say, what more can open? That's what happens with our faithfulness. Because a faith that is spread abroad is because of obedience and because of faithfulness and growing faithfulness. Works of faith, labors of love, patience of hope. I mean, after all, take a look at just a few months back with all this going on. Robin Nicole Whitaker here talking about evangelism. I love the good work they do. I've known Nicole since she was a teenager. I've known Rob for a number of years, met him not long after he and Nicole married. Love the work they're doing, folks. It, it, the only thing, Rob needs more enthusiasm. We're working on him. But what a great work. Back to the Bible, folks. I'm telling you, find somebody. And look at them and say, I am trying to learn how to use this. Will you help me? And instruct them and teach the gospel. That's a great tool. It's simple. It's easy. And then you had your Christian Servants Day, which Brother Massey and a group came over from West Fayetteville and spoke highly. They couldn't stay the whole time, but how much they enjoyed that. That encouraged you. Next week, Fundamentals of the Faith with Brother Jimmy Clark. I love Jimmy Clark. Jimmy is an elder also at Bethel. They are a great encouragement to our work and got to visit with Jimmy and, and uh, Brother Tim, his fellow elder last year. and They're very good to us. And a side note here, doesn't Brother Jimmy favor his daddy more as the years go by? Brother Winford. Beloved, when you think about this, it's because of your faithfulness that your faith is spread abroad and others can know. Now we come back to verse 8. We come back to verse 8. And why is their faith to Godward spread abroad? Here's the last one. They sounded out the word of the Lord. Look at verse 8. Sounded out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith to Godward is spread abroad. Not only in Pulaski and Giles County, but throughout the world in so many ways. They carried out that example. When we go back, for example, to 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 2, Paul said, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. People can see your faith onward. And because of your obedience and because of your faithfulness, but also because of your evangelism, you let others know. We're simply carrying forth God's will as commanded. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Mark 16, beginning with verse 15. 
Luke's account in Luke 24, verse 44, that we talked about this morning and passages following. John 20, verse 21. And then you take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, given the commission, and the result was acts. The action of Christians that went and told others about Jesus Christ. And that's where we find in Acts 8 and verse 4, they left Jerusalem they were scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the word. Beloved, how beautiful that is. And that's our charge today of what we can do. When I look back at your January seminar with the Whitakers, and then also I love your monthly Invite a Friend Day. I love that. That's beautiful. Brother Clark, with the fundamentals of the faith next week to strengthen us, you have a beautiful mixture in that you are strengthening yourselves, but you don't have the inward focus. You strengthen yourself inwardly so you can serve outward. To God be the glory. That's why your faith is indeed spread abroad. It is well known. The pattern is simple. We are obedient and we are to be faithful and through our faithfulness, we're evangelistic or we're about the work of the Lord. And when you look at 1 Thessalonians 1 in verse 5, that's the manner of men or manner of individuals that we are to be. We are to be individuals that are obedient, that are faithful, and that are evangelistic in telling others to Christ. East side, or rather, East Hill, rather. There's a lot of East in the works that I do. But East Hill, you keep on keeping onward. Again, obedience, faithfulness, and evangelism. Where are you? Where, where are you? Are you obedient? Oh, let me bring this question. Is that the first place you need to begin? With obedience. I want to know what I can do to get my life better, Brother Archie. Tell me, I try and I can't seem to get there. Do you believe in God, kind friend? Well, yes, I do. Do you know that without faith it is impossible to please Him? So you are pleasing God from the standpoint you do believe in Him. But the rest of the verse says, He that cometh to God must believe that He is. That He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Will you allow your faith to help you come to God? Well, yeah, how do I get there? How about that beautiful word, repentance? You know, a lot of people feel like they've lived lives so bad they can't be forgiven. They're underestimating the power of the blood of Christ. They're underestimating the greatness of the grace of God. Repentance means I'm turning away from the life that I'm living and I'm turning to a better life. People love to do that. People love to make changes of what's not working. To repent of our sins. Jesus commanded that in Luke 13, 3. Then allow your faith to confess Christ as the Son of God, just like the eunuch did in Acts 8, 37. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then to be obedient, you're baptized into Christ, immersed in water for the remission of your sins. Acts 2, 38. Remission means it's in remission, it's gone. Your sins will be washed away. The life that you have struggled with is washed away. It's buried with Christ, your blessed Redeemer, as the hymn goes. And you're raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 4 through 6, and you begin a faithful walk. So let me ask you, where are you? Do you need to obey the gospel of Christ this morning? Are you there at faithfulness? But let me ask this question. Are you struggling with your faithfulness? 
Now, I'm not trying from a while ago saying we're going to be better from the pandemic that everything's been peaches and cream. We've had some struggles. Take it from me, that sickness can knock you for a loop, and I had the mild case of it. I don't want it back. But sometimes have we allowed our faith to turn into fear. Not a simple concern, but a fear. Has it moved us to where I could be among my brethren and we've made the choice to move away? Friends, if you don't think Satan will take that advantage of us, he will. 2 Corinthians 2.11 He's like a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5. But yet we have a Savior that can take a pandemic and let us see His promises. He can take suffering and let us see Him as Savior. Dear brother or dear sister, if this thing has deterred you from a faithful walk, come back and battle that matter with a faithful walk. Has it affected your heart, your attitude? You know, Simon desired something that he had no part desiring when Peter rebuked him. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, when Peter rebuked him. He said, pray for me. And none of these things be laid to me. That's a Christian talking. So dear brother or dear sister, is your faith not sounding out? Maybe because fear took a greater control. Just asking for you to think. It's important that our works and our lives show forth the manner of men that we ought to be, the manner of individuals. And that to allow our faith to spread abroad. But it begins with you and I. If you've had yet to obey the gospel of Christ, or if you have struggled within your faith, you need the prayers, or you need to be restored unto the faith, this opportunity is the best opportunity you will have. If you need to respond, please come as we stand, as we sing together.